All right, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for today. We pray that you will bless our time together uh, as we discuss some fairly heavy topics today. We pray that they will, uh, we will always keep in mind that you, Lord, are in control. Bless our time together again in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, busy week. Uh, I don't really even know where to begin <laughs> this week. Again, I threatened to just take my phone and kind of flip through all the things that are going on. Um, I received a tremendous number of emails, articles, and that, and I do appreciate people sending that. And if I don't refer to your article or your video or whatever, don't don't take that personally. I just don't have the ability to review everything, uh, although I do review a lot of it. We live, we talk about the convergence of events and the things that are leading up to the return of the Lord. Uh, it is a very disrupted world. Let me make the, some clarifications about last week. Now, we do put our videos up at uh, Remnant Truth Network, rtntv.org. There is also an app, at least the Prophecy Updates we put up. But um, you can find them on YouTube at Fellowship Bible Chapel YouTube channel. I would recommend that you go to the video, go to the Fellowship Bible Chapel YouTube page, click on, go to, you just find Fellowship Bible Chapel, click on it. It would be helpful if you subscribed. You might still get notices, although we seem to be being throttled by YouTube a bit. Uh, but bookmark the page. Click on videos and then bookmark that page so that you can always go to it. Uh, a lot of times now, if you search on my name or Fellowship Bible Chapel, it's not going to show up. Uh, last week, the video that I did, the update that I did, was labeled as age inappropriate on YouTube. And so the people that did not, uh, the only way you could access it when you went to the YouTube channel was if you had a Google account and you signed in with that account and verified that you were over the age of 18. Now, personally, I have no idea what it was that caused that video to be labeled age inappropriate. I have a couple of suspicions. I did play some videos about the election and Sidney Powell interviews. I also played a video of someone uh, protest uh, in Washington, D.C., where a man got um, sucker punched, fell to the ground, and when they picked him up, he was bleeding. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that in this day and age that would be considered age inappropriate. Like kids don't see that like fifty thousand times on TV every week. Video games where they blow people up. Um, I mean, you can on face on your Facebook feed. Um, every I don't know why these things pop up, but I get these videos of every knockout that Mike Tyson ever had. And some of those are pretty, a lot worse than that guy on the street in DC. So look, something is going on. We're not uh, the favorites of social media. So rtntv.org. I will also say that uh, Christian Sentinel on Blog Talk Radio puts the audio version of the podcast up. And I believe Christian Sentinel is on Spotify uh, podcast um, app in addition to being on uh, Blog Talk Radio on on the internet. <coughs> so I don't know I don't know what the solution is, but it's happening to a lot of Christian and conservative and other channels. They just do not like it. And I'm sure if you're posting things on Facebook, I see people all the time. Um, a friend of mine posts somebody else's daily news prophecy update. And he just posts what's going on, just the basic headlines of what the person is talking about. It's Don Stewart's on uh, his channel. And it, not Don Stewart posted, but a friend of mine. And it just says what Don Stewart's going to talk about. And then yesterday, he was like blocked from posting that on Facebook. And it's like, these are headlines in the newspapers around the world. So we live in a time of great censorship. There are evil people out there that really want to take care of us and get rid of us. 
So I thought I would read Psalm 37 again because I think that it says a lot. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and ver verily shalt thou be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just, and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword, and have bent the, their bow, to cast down the poor and needy, and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bow shall be broken. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteousness. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume, and to smoke shall they consume away. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and am now old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful, and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil, and do good, and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment, and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land, and dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of God is in his heart, none of his steps shall slide. And you can read on through the end of that chapter for more. Look, uh, we have to take comfort in knowing that uh, God has this. It does seem that this is uh, a very, very uh, difficult time. So now, um, let's talk a little bit about the election. And it's interesting, the emails and messages I get. So somebody said, uh, one message I got this week said, you need to talk more about the election. In fact, that's all you need to talk about, because that's the only thing that's important. And then somebody from an overseas said, stop talking about your election. There's other things that are more important. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the election and some other stuff that I think is important. Uh, that I think the Lord has directed my heart towards. So we have this election. I'm not going to play any clips of the press conference that the Trump team had the other day. You're free to go and look at that. Uh, but this is typical. This is from the Washington Post. Escalating ploy to subvert vote. Now listen, I've been around for a little while now. Um, you know... What's the old saying? How old are you? Well, count the rings. And um, I've been through a lot of presidential elections, both as an observer, as a child, and then as a participant, since I could first vote in 1972. So almost 50 years. There are always election challenges that are made in many cases. 
We have had other times in the past where the elections in the United States have ended up in the House of Representatives at least twice. That's how John Quincy Adams was elected. And who was the other one? Rutherford, Rutherford B. Hayes, I believe, or Grover Cleveland. I can't remember which one. But they, these things have ended up in the House. This is not unusual. Uh, it has happened historically. Um, we have a different system here in the United States. I think it's a product of genius, the Electoral College, uh, because as you'll see, it keeps certain areas of the country from dominating all the other areas. And I think there's some, there's tremendous wisdom in that, particularly in this day and age. But you're, so you're going to see this, it's just this constant, you're, you're tearing down, the, you're destroying our democracy, you're challenging our democracy, our democracy is at risk, blah, 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 blah. You hear it constantly against the Trump team for raising what I think are, and I'll show you just an example in a minute, what I think are legitimate questions about how this election was conducted and what happened. Now, whether they're successful or not, I don't know. But I'm going to play, Vice President Pence gave a little press briefing the other day, and this is what happened at the end of the press briefing. This is, this is shocking to me. Are these journalists or activists? I don't know if you saw this. Here's what happened. Thank you. Every one of you. Why is the federal and you won't work with the transition. Well, that was, that was professional. So I'm, I'm going to give you an example, though. Of Here's a question that I have. Now, I saw this. I think Pamela Geller tweeted it out. So I went to the Nevada Secretary of State website, and I was downloading things, and I was switching from page to page in the website, not with what I, I guess I'm pretty fast or something. I must read very fast. Because in the midst of my research, this popped up. Pardon our interruption. As you were browsing something about your, something about your browser made us think you were a bot. There are a few reasons this might happen. You're a power user moving through this website with superhuman speed. <laughs> You've disabled cookies in your browser. A third-party browser plugin, such as Ghostry or NoScript, is preventing JavaScript from running. So the only one I can include is that I am a power user moving through the website with superhuman speed. <laughs> so try to keep up for the rest of the update. Now, one that, what, what Geller tweeted was, look, uh, there were 1,000, this is, this is a, P, a screenshot of a PDF downloaded from the Nevada Secretary of State that says there were 1,327, 394 votes cast in the general election in November, a few weeks ago. The problem was that when you go to the Nevada Secretary of State website, and you add up the votes, the official count for the voting, you come up with 1,405,000 votes. 1,405,000 votes for president is more than the 1,327,000 votes that the Nevada website says were cast for president. Now, that um, seems to be a problem. There were 80, 70 some thousand votes that, that just came and the vote margin of victory for Biden in the election was about 33,000. And the other thing that's interesting is that Biden got, so if you take all the Democratic House candidates and Democratic votes, and they break it down by party, 
the Democratic House candidates, three of them won, and they got 665,000 votes total. Biden got 703,000 votes, which means he got about 38,000 more votes than the Democratic candidates did. Now, to be fair, President Trump got far more votes than the House Republican House candidates did. But this is something that happened all over the place. And to me, I think it's very unusual that people will most usually vote for the president, the the Senate, U.S. Senate, and the House representatives. And they might not vote for dog catcher, you know, Joe, dog catcher down the, the ballot, the ticket, but they're usually going to vote for the people at the top. And the problem is there were hundreds of thousands of ballots that were marked only for Joe Biden. And some of them looked to have been run off on a machine. So the problem is, you know, the president's legal team is focused mainly on getting recounts or challenging, you know, dead people that voted or people that didn't fill out their ballot correctly and that type of thing. And the number, the difference, the margin of difference is too large that none of those are going to be successful. You're going to have to go the route that Sidney Powell is advocating. You're going to have to challenge the way the votes were tabulated. And there's a lot of people doing a lot of great work to show that this thing is just not um, not kosher. So they're going through all of these. And I, I did go back and check 2016. So is it unusual that they would have um, this number of, let's see this one right here, that many more votes tabulated than actually ballots cast. So I went back to 2016 using my superhuman (laughs) speed abilities, and uh, I found out that in the election of 2016, there were 1,125,000 ballots cast according to the Nevada Secretary of State website. I then went to the presidential totals, and I found that the total of votes cast was 1,125,385. So what that means is that the votes tabulated for president in 2016 were just a little bit less than the total number of ballots cast, which this makes common sense to me, does it not? So... The difference is only um, what do we have? Oh, here we go. So the difference is uh, whatever one million one hundred twenty-five thousand four twenty-nine minus one million one hundred twenty-five thousand three hundred eighty-five. So forty-four votes difference. That seems to be reasonable to me, and I was able to figure that out using, of course, my superhuman. Speed, which not just is not just uh, applies to uh, uh, browsing through websites. It also, I guess, my math is also just superb. So, I, you know, maybe there's an explanation. Maybe they haven't updated the totals, but this is something that I think needs to be looked at. I will say this: I am very troubled and disturbed that the president's uh, the. Tr- campaign lawsuit in Pennsylvania was dismissed yesterday by the judge with prejudice. And if you read the order, unless there's something going on that I don't know, I do not know that they have a shot shot any longer in Pennsylvania. They can appeal that order, uh, but... um, I at this point, I will be surprised that the Supreme Court takes the Court of Appeals will take it, the Supreme Court, to decide whether they want to take it or not. There's also been some things going around about how they reassigned uh, the justices, and the justices, the conservative justice on the, justices on the court got assigned to the circuits uh, that where the challenges will be, Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Georgia, seem to be the states where everybody's going to be fighting over. But the um, I don't know that that's that significant because the individual justices, they might be able to issue some preliminary orders 
in conjunction with an appeal. They might be able to stay the case. They might be able to issue a stay injunction or a restraining order. I, th that's not that usual. Uh, usually it's reviewed, especially cases of this political sensitivity. So I don't think that that's, that that happened is all that significant. I just don't see anything necessarily coming of it. But this election is going to have consequences. And so we titled this Making a List. And so I'm going to go through some things that already are happening with regard to the election. Um, and they're, they're going after people that voted for Trump, supported Trump. Uh, they've been harassing his lawyers. Some of them have withdrawn. They've raised the issue in court, and the judge didn't do anything about it. Now, to me, that's not surprising. When you're involved in active litigation and you accuse the other side or the other side accuses you and it happens of unethical conduct and that sort of thing, if you take that up to the uh, disciplinary council office at the local, at the state Supreme Court where this occurs, you can, you can be sanctioned for doing, for uh, engaging in unethical conduct. But when it comes up in the context of litigation, unless somebody punches somebody, the judges, the, the people at the Supreme Court or the disciplinary council that look at this are usually going to say, look, if it's still an issue when the case is over, come back and we'll take a look at it. But otherwise, we think it's just part of the advocacy process. So I'm not surprised that the Kirkland and Ellis associate that called up and harassed one of the lawyers got away with it. Kirkland and Ellis is now withdrawn from the case uh, where they were representing the Pennsylvania Secretary of State, I think. So this, this happens in litigation. I don't attach a great deal of significance to it, but the fact of the matter is that people are out there doxing people that are on the Trump legal team publishing their personal information and that type of thing. And to which some leftists, I saw in a Twitter argument about this, well, if you can get it publicly, then it's not private information. And they don't care. Remember I talked about the kid in Bakersfield uh, at the school who had posted something that, I know the context of what he posted or why he posted it, it but if you just pull that screenshot off, it looks terrible. Uh, that's, that's to be admitted. But the kid was harassed. He got death threats and that type of thing. Uh, he had, his parents had to withdraw him from the school. And the school was no help. So this is, this is a troubling thing that happens. And look, this is cyberbullying, where people just get on a topic and they just they never let it go. They just go after somebody, go after somebody, go, and it's just... It's not right, and it shows how shallow and pathetic that person's life is. That that's all they ever talk about, it seems like. Because I see this on the internet all the time. And you know that it happens. So here's an issue that's going to come up. Uh, this is from the American conservative, Rod Dreher, LGBT lobby coming after Christian schools. So the um, human rights campaign... They have the equal sign down there. That's their logo. They have issued this thing, Blueprint for Positive Change 2020. So they were ready. They have an agenda, and when they think Biden is going to be the president, and he may very well be, we have to acknowledge that this is a possibility. And so they're saying, okay, Biden, this is what you have to do. This is what we expect you to do. Now, do you think that Joe Biden is going to resist anything that they want to do? The, and I'm assuming that he might even be able to understand what it is that they want him to do. Back when Joe Biden actually did things like campaign, June 1st, 2019, here in Columbus, Ohio, this is what Joe Biden said about the Equality Act. The Trump administration has not only been a disaster for human rights at home, but around the world. Just look at the ugliness, the anti-LGBTQ actions taken by this administration, challenges 
to the right to marry, barring transgender service members, removing Title IX protection for trans students. 28 states, as you know, you can still be fired for being gay. 30 states for being transgender. That's why we need the Equality Act that just passed the House with a bipartisan support, I might add. You know, that's the difference in electing the Democrat House makes. Now we need to elect a Democratic Senate that will pass it. And I'm sure I'm no different than anyone else, but I promise you, if I'm elected president, that'll be the first thing I ask to be done. Because it will send a message around the world, not just at home. Here in Ohio, there are some protections for LGBTQ individuals at the city level, Mr. Mayor, thank you, and for the state employees, and they're important. But it's not nearly enough. Ohio has to pass the Ohio Fairness Act. And by the way, they had hearings on it this week in the Ohio House, which is veto-proof majorities in both Ohio House and Senate for Republicans, and they're considering this thing, the Ohio Fairness Act, which is the state version of the Equality Act. And the Equality Act, as I've said many times, it contains a provision in there that says the Religious Freedom Restoration Act will have no will be no defense to any claim made under the Equality Act. You cannot come in and say, I acted that way based on my religious freedom. This is they this is the human rights campaign and the Democrats' attempt to turn America into Europe. We have a thing called the free exercise of religion in America. Not the freedom of religion, which they have in Europe, where you can believe anything you want. Believe me, they believe a lot of crazy things over in Europe, just like we do over here. But you're not allowed to express it in Europe. And that's why they've enacted things to stop what they consider, you know, they consider all religion to be hate-based, therefore any expression is hate. And so that's why they, they've put these restrictions on the tech companies and the tech companies being um, what doesn't look like, I've seen Jack Dorsey, it doesn't look like he works. It, you know what I mean? Like he takes a shower and that type of thing or washes his hair, even when he's testifying before Congress. So we know he's not that busy, but the tech companies are lazy enough or on board with that, that they adopt the restrictions in Europe and apply them here in the United States and lead to censorship. And then here is another thing that the human rights campaign wants to have. This is in their manifesto or their blueprint. Ensure non-discrimination policies and science-based curricula are not undermined by religious exemptions to accreditation standards. Do you see what they're doing? They're acting like the Equality Act has been put in place and that the religious freedom exceptions under the, that would apply under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that was enacted back by and signed by President Clinton back in the 90s, don't apply. Listen to this, quote, language regarding accreditation of religious institutions of higher education and the Higher Education Opportunity Act could be interpreted to, to require accrediting bodies to accredit religious institutions that discriminate or that do not meet science-based curricula standards. The Department of Education should issue a regulation clarifying that this provision, which requires accreditation agencies to respect the state admission of religious institutions, does not require the accreditation of religious institutions that do not meet neutral accreditation standards, including non-discrimination policies and scientific curriculum requirements, including uh, gender reassignment uh, therapy. You know, like when you, somebody comes to you and says, I'm confused, I was born a man, but I really think I'm a woman. So if you try to counsel that person to not accept that, that that might not be good, or that it might be bad to have... Um, hormone therapy, suppression therapy for young people, all of that would be prohibited in any school that taught in their counseling programs, a Christian school that you could counsel someone this way, the school would be at risk of losing its accreditation. And if they lose their accreditation, as Rod Dreher says in his article, 
at the American Conservative, if that happens, the schools are going out of business. So Christian colleges and that type of thing will be in big trouble. Now, this is another interesting thing. This is what's going to happen if a Biden administration comes into play. This is a letter. It was written by a professor at Iowa State University in the School of Journalism. What happened was there was a Young Republicans chapter on campus, and the Young Republicans chapter came out and said, you might want to be ammoing up essentially in a tweet. So this professor said, because they said that, which is their way of saying this is how we support our Second Amendment rights. In fact, in that speech that I played last week of Justice Alito, which I didn't play all of it of, he essentially said, listen, the sequence of the amendments in the Bill of Rights is very important. So you have the primary ones in the First Amendment, freedom of speech and freedom of religion, expression of religion, and the right of assembly to petition the government for redress of grievances. And then you have the Second Amendment, which is kind of a way that you're always sure that nobody takes away the ones in the First Amendment. And Justice Alito is right. Now, the left hates that. So what this school of journalism process that, the school of journalism, this assistant professor or associate professor said, they need to be removed from campus and not recognize their chapter of young Republicans because of their viewpoint. Now, to the credit of the Iowa State University, the Iowa State University wrote back and said, dear professor, I forget what her name is, Win Kelly Winfrey at Iowa State. Dear Kelly, um, you're wrong. <laughs> There's things that we have to do. So when they got down to point two, they say demand two, changes to the student code of conduct. Student codes of conduct or other, uh, uh, other universities that have attempted to punish students for speech deemed hateful, derogatory, threatening, insensitive, or described with other such terms have consistently been struck down as unconstitutional. In other words, professor, you, are, you claim to be a professor of journalist. You ought to really know what the First Amendment says. Now, you can argue against their views and all that. But, dear Professor Snowflake, yeah. you don't know what you're talking about. Also, while the principles of community are ideals to which we should all aspire, they are neither laws nor policy and are not enforceable. We should treat each other with respect, which she certainly did not do. Now, this is another st story. Megyn Kelly. We all criticize Megyn Kelly. And she even describes herself as center-left. She lives in New York City on the Upper West Side. She sends her school kids to a school... Uh, private school tuition is $56,000 per year per student. I think she has one daughter in the New York City public schools, and she has two sons in the private school. So that's $112,000 a year in tuition that Megyn Kelly and her husband are paying to send their kids to this school. And this school sent a letter out to the kids, and they brought it home, and it said, listen to some of the stuff that's in here. This is, I'm quoting from the, the website at Education Post. If you really want to make a difference in black lives, change how you teach white kids. And this was posted in June, and now it was distributed, and it was sort of like, hey, this is what you guys should do in this school. I'm just telling you that if Biden, if Kamala Harris becomes president, this stuff is all going to be shoved down everybody's throats. We know this. If you really want to make a difference, change how you teach white kids. Listen, to this is a quote from this. 
Now, I want you to listen to this and identify who's the racist in this thing. This is, this is like Orwell. I mean, how is this? It's crazy. There's a George Floyd in every school where black children learn. Black children are screamed at, berated, surveilled, and searched in schools. Black children are slammed and dragged, kicked and prodded in classrooms. Black children are denied an education and disrespected because of their culture. Black children are groomed for containment. We've got children walking on tape with hands over their mouths like prisoners in training. Black children are suspended, detained, demerited, and isolated in the schools for trivial things every day. And there's a killer cop sitting in every school where white children learn. Let me repeat that sentence. And there's a killer cop sitting in every school where white children learn. They hear the litany of bad statistics and stereotypes about scary black people in their classes and on the news. They gleefully soak in their whitewashed history that downplays the Holocaust of indigenous native peoples on on. Black kids are in terrible shape. If you let them tell it, black kids are in terrible shape while white children are doing gloriously. He's saying that. But how can white kids be doing okay when they're growing up to be police officers, district attorneys, mayors, judges, media, mothers, fathers, and presidents who take away black life and call it justified? As black bodies drop like flies around us from physical, medical, economic, and material deprivation and violence at white hands, how can we in any way of any of our minds or metrics be, conclude that whites are all right? What kind of warp standards are these? And that was what this school on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, mm -hmm. one of the most fluent areas in the, in the country, if not the world, thought this, this would, we have to teach our kids. It goes further. The Illinois Department of uh, the State of Illinois issued guidelines about what they should teach kids. So here is, uh, and you can look it up on their website, content selections in all curricular, culturally responsive teachers and leaders. These are guidelines that are under consideration to be issued to all teachers in all public schools and universities and colleges in the state of Illinois, two states away. Culturally responsive teachers and leaders intentionally embrace student identities and prioritize representation in the curriculum. In turn, students are not only given a chance to identify with the curriculum, they become exposed to other cultures within their schools and both their local and global communities. Now this probably came from Bill Ayers in Chicago or somebody that was taught by him. Maybe even somebody that became president. There was a close friend of Bill Ayers who started his campaign in his home. The weather underground left us terrorists. But look at number five. Embrace and encourage progressive viewpoints and perspectives that leverage asset thinking toward traditionally marginalized populations. It goes on for other things that are to be taught. Recognize how their identity, race, ethnicity, national origin, gender identity, sexual orientation, et cetera, et cetera, affects their perspectives and beliefs about pedagogy and students. Educate themselves about, this is what good teachers do, educate themselves about students' communities, cultures, and histories. Critically think about the institutions in which they find themselves working to reform these institutions whenever, whenever and wherever necessary. That's one of the main goals. Another one is this, uh, be aware of the effects of power and privilege. This is cultural Marxism. This is, this is critical race theory being shoved into elementary schools and all other schools in the state of Illinois, unless it's overturned. This is, to me, this is, uh, this is a very strange statistic. Biden voting counties control 70% of America's economy. What does this mean for the nation's political economic divide? And so it does. It looks at the size of the county's ec economy and compares 
Biden the blue to Trump the red. And so they say the 2,400 countries run, more than 2,400 countries won, counties, excuse me, counties won by Donald Trump, generated 29% of America's GDP in 2018. Troubling. Here is uh, another article from the New American. And it says, China's social credit system in America, Biden's budding corporatocracy. Now, there was a hearing this week, and Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey testified before Congress. And Zuckerberg was asked, hey, we have a whistleblower from your company that told us about a thing called Centra. It tracks your Facebook users, and it tracks them even when they're not on Facebook. What's up with that? Well, uh, Senator, I'm not really... Oh, I've got to do this the right way. Uh, Senator, I am not directly aware of that information. Well, Mr. Zuckerberg, would you like to go find out and get back to us? Well, Senator, uh, it might be that we have something, but uh, I don't know anything about it. So, in his typical robotic... Um, by the way, if you catch him blinking, you know, take a picture of it. But this is, look, so we've talked about the Chinese social credit system, and this is a terrible thing that China does. They, people like this journalist, I've played clips of him. He woke up one day and he found out he couldn't even buy a train ticket or an airplane ticket to go anywhere. He was effectively put under house arrest. Like, we're all sort of being put under house arrest in many respects now. But they're saying is, look, you're not socially acceptable. You can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. And this is what the left is doing in this country. Listen, I don't know how else to say this. We are in the middle of a communist revolution. We are way down the road. And so the question is, what do we do? How do we resist it? Because it's... <laughs> It has many, much more impact than just our own personal creature comforts. This is about the truth. Uh, Bill Mullenberg, who blogs, and he does some good stuff every now and then, he has a blog today, and it's called, because today is, today is a significant day to a lot of us, November 22nd. We all remember November 22nd, 1963, right? We remember where we were. I was sitting in fourth grade at Wurstler Elementary School in North Canton, Ohio. Miss Klotz was my teacher. And in the afternoon, she went out in the hall and she came in crying and then told us that the president had been assassinated, shot in Dallas and was dead. And I remember that weekend. I watched everything on TV. I saw Lee Harvey Oswald get shot. So here's what, um, nearly 50 years ago, this is what Bill Millenberg wrote. This is back in 2013. He wrote, it, so he wrote it on the 50th anniversary of the assassination. 50 years ago, November 22, 1963, three famous men died. But the death of one greatly overshadowed the death of the others. The assassination of President John F. Kennedy made world news so that the death of the other two on the same day, received almost no coverage in, by comparison. Who were the other two people that died? C.S. Lewis and Aldous Huxley. Huxley's 1932 novel, Brave New World, was a very important work, alerting us to where we were heading in the West. Lewis also wrote some important things. He wrote, a, he rightly foretold of a class of technocrats and well-meaning experts who would seek to conquer nature and its ills. You understand that? <laughs> he wrote this seven years ago, by the way, of a technocrats who would try to cure, conquer nature and its ills only to end up conquering man. As he said in this 1947 volume, The Abolition of Man, quote, what we call man's power over nature turns out to be power exercised by some men over other men with nature as its instrument. Man's conquest of nature, if the dreams of some scientific planners are realized, means the rule of a few hundreds of men over billions upon billions of men. There neither, there neither is nor can be any simple increase of power on man's side. 
Each new power won by man is a power over man as well. This is brilliant stuff. Great article. You can go to Bill Muhlenberg, M-U-E-H-L, Muhlenberg, Muhlenberg, Bill Muhlenberg, M-U-E-H-L-E-N-B-E-R-G.com. Excellent blog post uh, that somebody sent me this morning. Recognizing that on that day in 63, some significant things happened. And he goes on and he talks about Huxley and the things that he wrote about. Here's a lady, Abigail Shire. She wrote a book, Irreversible Damage, The Transgender of Craze Seducing, uh, The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters. She said, listen, there's a spike in transgender confu gender confusion among teenage girls all over the world now. What is going on? This is many, 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 many times more than has ever been observed before. I told you a couple of weeks ago, 30% of women under 30 identify as bisexual or lesbian. Now we have the transgender problem. So she wrote a book. What are we doing to cause this problem? Seems like a valid thing to do. These people are deeply troubled and need help. Human rights campaign says you can't even talk about it. Amazon took her book down for a while. She finally got it back. Target refused to sell her book initially. And as I think Tucker Carlson said the other night on a show when he was discussing it, she got a PhD in political correctness in the Chinese social system this week. MailChimp, they went out, the people, um, conservative groups that were setting up, uh, sending out things to, about rallies to stop the steal and that type of thing. MailChimp canceled their accounts. PayPal pulls accounts. Uh, Bank of America, other big banks, Chase, have pulled accounts of people that just because of the viewpoint that they express. So listen. The whole thing sort of revolves around, we're all concerned about the mark of the beast. And I have some comments about that. I, I did a show with Doug Camp and Scott Har Harwell, a couple friends of mine. Uh, I think you can find it on Doug Camp's YouTube channel. And we talked about is, you know, what's the mark of the beast? And is these virus things, is this the mark of the beast? Short answer is, we don't think they're the mark of the beast. But aside from that, what I'm trying to tell you is the inability to buy or sell is already rumping rampant through our culture and society without the vaccine. So all of the technologies and things that we're worried about, the mark of the beast, it's, they're already being implemented. And it's not being implemented by the government in America. It's being, inter it's being implemented by corporations. And if you challenge a corporation that you for why are you doing that, you'll be fired. This is, this is a massive problem. This election was very important. And to the extent that there are bad election systems out there, somebody should have been screaming bloody murder about it. You can't do it. I'm concerned. You can't change that in four weeks after an election. Absent a miracle. So if it happens, we know it's a miracle. Amen. It'll be clear. It, what's going to happen with these litigations, it's either going to be the greatest victory in legal history, or it's going to be the greatest flop. There's nothing in between the two. So if you think this is right, and I, you know, support the people and what they're doing. But, uh, so this is, so now here comes our friend Baby Trudeau from up in Canada. This is an article from the Toronto Sun, JT's, Justin Trudeau's New World Order. Here is what he said. I'm going to play what he said. This was at a UN teleconference, or Zoom comp, whatever they have these things these days. Nobody ever said anything. And at the beginning of this session, there was Justin Trudeau, uh, Guterres, the Secretary General, and there was another guy. And the other guy was from the UN. He said, listen, this is about how do we support the UN Sustainable Development Goal, 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. 
So they had, I think they had the Jamaican prime minister there, and they had Trudeau, and here is what Trudeau said. The last six months have laid bare fundamental gaps and inequities within our societies and between them. As with climate change, those who have the least are impacted the most. That's why last spring, Canada worked with Prime Minister Andrew Holness and Secretary General Antonio Guterres to convene a high-level meeting to discuss how leaders around the world could work together to close these gaps and build a better, more equitable system that works for everyone. We understand that right now we have to fix urgent problems, but in the long run, we also have to fix the system so that it works for everyone. To eliminate this virus anywhere, we need to eliminate it everywhere. While scientists work around the clock to develop a vaccine as governments, we have the responsibility to ensure it'll be distributed quickly and fairly around the world. And I accidentally clipped out the part where he says, we need a great reset because of the virus. Well, that led to a lot of things. Um, initially, they people said, well, the New York Times, they published something. They said, because a lot of people said, he's doing the Great Reset, New World Order, globalist, all this stuff, right? Which is what you would take away from that if you were able to think enough to to exhale, you know, just to breathe out. That's all you need to be able to think to do to understand he's got an agenda. <laughs> so the New York Times, they put a thing up on their website, the baseless Greek reset conspiracy theory rises again. And this article uh, that was published in the National Post, the Financial Post, part of the National Post on Friday, talks about this video. It says, the video picked up by the Rebel and other online media drove thousands of hits and fired up the political right, including Fox's Tucker Carlson, who ran with the idea that Trudeau was part of a global push to use COVID-19 pandemic to promote a radical leftist reorganization of the global economy. Then came a bit of pushback from the media left. The New York Times ran a piece dismissing the anti-Trudeau social media outburst under a headline, the baseless Great Reset conspiracy theory rises again. The BBC's conspiracy theory beat reporter ridiculed the social media outburst. How absurd, he said, to believe that dumb, dumb politicians all came together to brilliantly execute a global master plan. So here's what's happening. You can see things happening. You, you can have the Trump team present hundreds of affidavits with thousands of paragraphs of people sworn under oath. And at the same time, you have the media saying, there's no evidence, there's no evidence. Here's the evidence, right here. There's no evidence. It's insane. And so now the guy comes out and says, we need to reset the world, economy, and system. He said, change the system. Did he not? And if you say that and say, I'm concerned about that, you have all these major media outlets saying, that didn't happen. There's even a video of Justin Trudeau interviewed, I think it was published the other day, he says, I don't know why people said that I wanted to reset the system. Because you said you wanted to reset the system. You liar. I don't, you cannot believe anything this man says at all. Here's what the article also says. Um, these aren't conspiracy theories. These are plans laid out. This is from the National Post in Canada. These plan, are plans laid out in the open for anyone with eyes to see. Sure, some conspiracy theory types have attached themselves for these plans, but that doesn't matter, that that doesn't make them less real or less worrisome, that the prime minister would seek to use a global pandemic, one that has claimed the lives of more than 10,000 Canadians, to turn 
towards these to turn towards these projects to change Canada is wrongheaded. Trudeau didn't run seeking a mandate for such change. He should change it. And then they go on to cite from the Great Reset website of the World Economic Forum what the World Economic Forum says about it. The opportunity, as we enter a unique window of opportunity to shape the recovery, this initiative will offer insights to help inform all those determining the future state of global relations, the direction of national economies, the priorities of societies, the nature of business models, and the management of a, com of a global commons. Drawing from the vision and vast expertise of the leaders engaged across the forums, communities, the Great Reset Initiative has a set of dimensions to build a new social contract that honors the dignity of every human being. And Trudeau, in his little talk, used the term, Build Back Better, which just happened to be the campaign slogan of the President Harris, or excuse me, President Biden, the Biden-Harris ticket, Build Back Better. And they say, yeah, it's the same words, but he wasn't trying to do anything with it. That's what the media said. Who are you, who you going to believe? This is like the emperor's new clothes thing. Oh, look at the emperor's new clothes. He's naked. No, no, no. It's you can't. Who are you going to believe me? You're going to believe me or your lying eyes? So the article goes on. Now they have come together. There is a master plan. There is no great secret global backroom conspiracy behind closed doors. What we have is an upfront, publicly coordinated, globe-spanning political power campaign to use the COVID-19 pandemic as a launch pad for a reshaping of the global economy. The main driving force behind this great reset is the World Economic Forum and its founder, Klaus Schwab. And so the media says, they're not using COVID-19 to do this. That's, you're making that up. This is Klaus Schwab's book, COVID-19, The Great Reset. In June, the 82-year-old Schwab, who has been plotting to bring down market capitalism at least since the 1970s, co-authored a book. COVID-19, The Great Reset, a book that claimed that the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown opened the door for the economic reforms he has long sought. The possibilities for change in the resulting new order are now unlimited and only bound by our imagination. In June, Prince Charles said there's a golden opportunity to see something good from this crisis. Global crises know no borders and highlight how independent we are as one people sharing one planet. And if you're not aboard with it, you're on the list. They're making a list. So I went back and I found a video from Schwab back at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs done, I think, earlier this year or last, late last year, in which he said this. I want you to listen. It's about a minute clip. But listen to what he says at the end of the clip. Uh, of course, the first industrial revolution we are all familiar with. Um, uh, it was the uh, invention of the, ste of the steam engine, which actually helped to enlarge our physical power. And then we had the second um, industrial revolution which mainly happened here in this country very much also here in this region which allowed mass production and then we had the third industrial revolution with the starting of the computer age uh, and the digital um, era and now the fourth industrial revolution is not just a prolongation of this digitalization it's much more um, it's a combination of technologies. It's not just the digital technology. Just think of genetics, think of brain research and so on. And the power of the fourth industrial revolution comes from the combination of all those technologies. 
actually I was uh, saying um, it's at the end what, what the fourth industrial revolution will lead to is a fusion of our physical, our digital, and our biological identities. Okay, do you see that? The fusion of those identities? That's the fourth industrial revolution. And that's what we've been talking about. And so what does the media say? Well, he, didn't, he really didn't say that. You're misinterpreting what he said. How? Show me. So it is not by verbal chance that Trudeau used the word reset in his video conference speech, the National Post says. The pandemic also made a cameo appearance Thursday when Environment Minister Jonathan Wilkinson spoke at a press conference to announce Ottawa's new net zero 2050 carbon emissions legislation. The new law, he said, is a key piece of the government's overall plan to build back better as we emerge from the pandemic into a brighter, cleaner, and more prosperous future. In the UK, they've banned, as of 2030, you will not be able to buy a gasoline-powered vehicle in the UK. Now, I don't, I, I'm waiting for the, the next thing is, do you, do you idiots understand that you have to have some kind of fuel to make electricity? Oh, it's all going to be solar. Have you been to England? <laughs> I love England, okay? I love the people there. But I was there two years ago, right at this time of year. It was dark at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You're not going to get solar. The lights that are burning from electricity don't give you solar power. Oh, goodness. It says the WEF, the World Economic Forum website, is the global atroprop, central launch for pandemic-driven policy activism. Schwab is also backed by the powercrats at the UN, IMF, and other global governments agencies, along with hundreds of private sector players. The global business consultancy, McKinsey, uh, a strategic WEF partner, recently issued a report titled, Rethinking the Future of American Capitalism. And if you go to their website, this is what Schwab wrote in... Um, he wrote a book, Stakeholder Capitalism. His manifesto in 1973, almost 50 years ago, set a code of ethics for business leaders. Their new manifesto issued last year before the Davos thing in January, the universal purpose of a company in the fourth industrial revolution. And they have this website, which I've showed you many times. I started talking about this back in April. April 1st, I put up a midweek update because I thought this was significant. This website with all these links, and it in the middle of they always have these different topics. They have dozens of topics. One of them is COVID-19, and it shows you all the links of things that all they're doing, developing a vaccine, travel restrictions, all of this stuff. Here's a new article that just came out Friday by good old Javier Solana, the former EU foreign policy foreign minister guru. The Biden formula. Just as U.S. President-elect Joe Biden has pledged to build back better to promote economic recovery, America also urgently needs to reinvent its international role. And here's another thing on the WE Forum website, corporate governance. They have an opinion on everything. Everything it is that they want to change. You notice the first one there on the right-hand side, diversity and inclusion. It's a numbers game, but not the one most people think. For the last quarter of the 20th century, Friedman's, I, he talks about the conflict between Schwab and Milton Friedman, the great conservative economist. Friedman's ideas were the wave that drove much of the uh, corporate governance and po government policy based on economic freedom and competition. Today, Klaus Schwab is heading a wave, is leading a wave to use the pandemic to reset the world economic order. It is unmistakable. 
So I'm going to refer you to the video I did the other night. This is uh, just briefly, there's been all this stuff about the COVID vaccines and people are concerned. And I think it's legitimate to be concerned. There are a whole bunch of different vaccines. Somebody asked the question, I saw an article this morning, is it possible to me we have too many vaccines just for the COVID, let alone all the other stuff? And I think there's a legitimate concern that these vaccines, regardless of all this other stuff, may overstimulate your autoimmune system. And I had some cases, medical cases, one of my career involving autoimmune diseases, and they're very complicated and they're very poorly understood. Some suggest that that might be vaccines. I, I don't think the science is entirely clear, but it is a legitimate area of concern. There are also, um, so Pfizer and BioNTech have developed another um, type of vaccine. So we have different classes of vaccines. AstraZeneca has come out with a vaccine that's a more traditional vaccine. And vaccines like that are usually grown, manufactured in a, a, a cell, human cell culture. And AstraZeneca says on their website, this comes from aborted fetuses, our cell line. That's an ethical, religious, serious issue for Christians. Now there are other fetal cell lines that don't come from aborted tissue. They might come from um, placentas and that type of thing that they've harvested. But there's this, a couple of these, come, these cell lines from aborted babies. They've been around for decades, and they keep dividing. They're usually after so many divisions, but these seem to have, I hate to say this, but some kind of special power about them that they keep dividing and dividing. And so a, a number of vaccines, not all vaccines, use those in their production. And that should be an ethical consideration that all Christians, religious consideration for all Christians to consider. Should I take, aside from whether you should take a vaccine at all, or not, if you're going to take a vaccine, should you use those? And I think the answer clearly is, no, you should not do that. That is, that's bad. That's a pretty easy one. Okay. Now, the, a couple of the other vaccines are being done by Moderna, a company called Moderna, and... Um, Pfizer, Pfizer BioNTech. So these are different vaccines. They use a thing called modified RNA. They take a piece of RNA and they uh, put it in these, as this article in the Financial Times the other day says, breakthrough crafted from tiny particles. Two breakthrough vaccines that use the same revolutionary technology have been shown to be highly effective in preventing COVID-19. But differences in the way the shots are designed affect how quickly production can be increased and how they, are in how they are distributed. One by Pfizer, one by Moderna, recorded efficacy rates higher than 94% in cl clinical trials, raising global hopes they can provide a route out of the pandemic. At the heart of both shots is a strand of messenger ribonucleic acid, or M, small m, RNA, a sequence of about 2,000 biochemical letters of genetic code that carry instructions to the recipient's immune system to recognize and fight coronavirus infection. Now, these do not use, and there are pro-life websites out there that track these things, these do not use fetal uh, cell tissue in their manufacture. They use what are called nanoparticles to protect, keep the RNA stable, but there's also a problem is that to keep the RNA stable in this technology, they have to be stored. I think the Pfizer vaccine is like 90 degrees below zero, which pretty much eliminate, there's no, there's very few refrigeration systems. I mean, Mayo Clinic came out and said, we, we couldn't store this thing. How are we going to do this? How are we going to transmit this stuff? And how are we going to get billions of people vaccinated and distribute billions of doses so there's a, logis there's a huge logistical problem with these. Now, Moderna is a little bit better. It can be stored at minus 20 degrees centigrade or whatever, Fahrenheit. So th and most refrigeration systems in the world can be adjusted to that. So Moderna, but Moderna is much more complex in its manufacturing. So look, I think we're going to have a little bit of time to evaluate how these vaccines go. And again, I'm not getting into the whole issue about Vaccine or not, 
the reality of the situation is going to be is that companies are going to adopt rules. You can't work here if you don't have the vaccine. You can't come to the office. You can't get in a plane. You can't go to a Ohio State football game unless you have your pass to show that you have the vaccine. So there's a real practical side of this uh, that it's, it's going to raise a lot of things. There's an article in Nature from back in uh, July 2020, COVID-19 vaccine development and a potential nanomaterial path forward. They were talking about Moderna and um, Pfizer vaccines that use nanoparticles and modified RNA. There's a lot of theories out there that this changes your DNA and it renders you non-human. Now, I'm going to be right up front with you. The notion, and because people say this is the mark of the beast, and I've heard people do prophecy updates, this will or this will be the mark of the beast. I think they have a massive theological problem. Are you telling me that God designed us so that somebody could plunge a needle into your arm and make it impossible for you to be saved and condemn you to hell for all eternity. The God that I know in the Bible does not do that. And you have a massive theological problem, and you need to seriously deal with that issue before you start spreading all of these rumors about it. And I've asked over and over, show me how it changes your DNA. And I have yet to have anybody give me anything except the video of somebody who said it. And I just think there's a lot of things that are being said about this that aren't true. That does not mean, okay, I want to repeat this. If you go out and say, John Haller says it's okay to take the vaccine, you are a liar. And you are in sin, and if you do that, you need to come to me and repent. Okay? Because I am not saying that, but we need to discuss the theology of the mark of the beast. And I think that that's a an issue. So here's a little graphic that we used the other day about is it the mark of the beast flow chart. And I think this was very well done, you know, is it required for everyone in the world to have to buy or sell? No, that's not the mark of the beast. Yes, okay, now you have some other things to go through and analyze before you get down to whether it's the mark of the beast. And the people I see running around saying it's the mark of the beast have not done this. It's called a little bit of homework. And I think it's a very serious issue, in addition to the theological aspect. And I have they, people send me these things about, oh, they're going to give you a vaccine to destroy your God gene. Folks, I've debunked those videos. There is no God gene determined by science. Do you understand that? Do you understand the theological nonsense that you're propagating by saying that? That God would design it so somebody could stick a needle in your arm and condemn you to hell? Listen, the mark of the beast will be very apparent as to what it is. Now, the separate issue is, are we concerned about these vaccines? Yeah, we don't know what they are. And with these use of some of the technology that I've been reading about, they may overstimulate your immune system, and that's a big problem for health. If you mess up your immune system, you can really impact a person dramatically. So... John Haller does not say it's okay to take this vaccine. Is that understood? Okay. But there are serious issues that people are going to be faced with in this world to live and function with the way this thing is going. There's a good article in the Daily Mail today about everything they told us about this uh, virus has been wrong. And you know what? There's some truth to that. They're using it to control people. It's horrible. Delta now has 460, there's now over 500 passengers on a no-fly list that other airlines are picking up. So if you don't wear your mask on a Delta plane, in fact, I saw a guy on Spirit Airlines. Maybe it should be called Demonic Spirit Airlines. He said, if I tell you twice and you don't take it to put your mask up, and you don't do it, you're going on the list, we're making a list, and you'll be on it, and you'll never be able to fly on another airline in your life.
giving power to people that shouldn't have power. This is this is bad. So you we see this this is picture. I think this is from um, the Netherlands. The uh, the lockdowns. Yeah, it's all over the world now. I mean, and it's worse. By the way, I'm not going to get. <laughs> so to anybody who said I should focus more on the Middle East, I'm not going to get to it today. Because we're already pushing an hour and a half, and we have some meetings here that are pretty important to church. And I'm not saying this virus is not serious either, by the way, because we know more at FBC about that, how serious it can be, than just about anywhere else on planet Earth. So here's what's going on. This is a video from um, oh, Germany, Slovakia, and other places. Here's a mother in Italy. I'll, parap- I'll translate for you. My child is starving. She's three years old. You're killing my kid because of these stupid lockdowns. My baby is dying. That's, that's sort of my thing of that. And it, it just goes on and on. I mean, this is all over the place. And of course, here is the world's leading hypocrite. Governor Gavin Newsom of the uh, state of uh, California at dinner the other night at the French Laundry in Napa, average ticket per person, $350. With no mask, right? Didn't he just say you have to wear your mask and you can only lift it up to take a bite? Okay, let me count the people there wearing a mask. I don't see any. By the way, one of the people at the table is the head of the California Medical Association. These people are dictators. They are trying to reset and change everything. And nothing applies to them because they're the global elites. And they're better than everybody. And it's going to affect people. Um... I think, I won't play it, but this was a business summit the other day with Bill Gates. Bill Gates said, what do you, what do you well, let me just play it. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want to misquote him. So, and so if you don't like Bill Gates, turn it off, you know, go get a cup of coffee, it's only a minute. So the guy asked him about, whoops. Yeah, <laughs> Gates and then the Mark of the Beast, that's interesting. Do you think this is, a long-term phenomenon uh, that, that people are going to live in Zoom cities, that people aren't going to go to meetings in person? Or do you think that the second uh, that people can get back on an airplane, and if you're a salesperson or uh, in some kind of business where you have to go uh, kiss the ring of this client, and if one person gets on the plane, the next person, the next salesperson is going to have to get on the plane, and that we're back to, uh, that we're back to where we were uh, pre-pandemic? Well, my prediction would be that uh, over 50% of business travel and over uh, 30% of days in the office uh, will go away. That now that it's not the gold standard that, yes, you flew all the way here to sit in front of me, that you can do the virtual connection, uh, that <laughs> it will be a very high threshold for actually doing that business trip and that there will be ways that you can work from home uh, a lot of the time. Okay, so that's Gates' opinion. And uh, it's also interesting that Microsoft, which I don't know if he's still on, he's not the CEO anymore, he hasn't been for 20-some years, but Microsoft has now come out with some kind of, um, to replace Skype. You know, it's like a Zoom thing that's built into Microsoft that you can use and pay for and make people at Microsoft more money. So let me just do one thing. Um, can I take can I take five minutes? Okay, I no, I'm not going to finish because it won't be five minutes. Um, there's a lot going on on the northern border of Israel. Last week I showed you a picture of things that were going on in Lebanon, or I'm sorry, in Syria on the Syrian side. And now this is another thing. This comes from the UN Security Council about all the red dots 
are places that the UN security troops are really blocked from moving because of the way Hezbollah does things. In other words, they can't be very effective. So Israel is going to have to take care of itself. So when you couple that with the, uh, uh, the Golan, um, I found a video at the IDF called the Alpha Line. So here's what the Alpha Line says. Then I'll say a little bit about Tehran, and then we'll finish up. I'm here on the Golan Heights in northern Israel, close to Israel's border with Syria. Behind me is the Alpha Line. West of the Alpha Line is Israel. East of the Alpha Line is a 155 square mile UN monitored buffer zone in Syrian territory, which separates Israeli forces from Syrian forces that are stationed east of the Bravo Line. The fence that you can see here was built by Israel in recent years in its entirety on the Israeli side of the Alpha Line. So, how did this situation emerge and why is it important today? To understand the current state of affairs, we have to look back into the history of the region. In 1948, immediately after declaring independence, Israel was attacked by six Arab armies, including Syria, from its north. This war became known as Israel's War of Independence. In 1949, after the war ended, Israel and Syria signed an armistice agreement overseen by the United Nations. However, in the following years, Syrian forces repeatedly violated the agreement and subjected the communities of northern Israel to continued attacks from the Golan Heights. Eighteen years later, the Six-Day War erupted. As an outcome of the Syrian attacks during the war, Israel gained control over the Golan Heights. On October 6, 1973, the holiest day in the Jewish calendar called Yom Kippur, Syria launched a surprise attack on Israel from the north, along with Egypt from Israel's south. In a three-week-long Yom Kippur war, Israel countered the Syrian attack and retained its positions on the Golan Heights by the end of the war. In the aftermath of the war, the United States and the Soviet Union brokered an Israeli-Syrian agreement on disengagement. The agreement was then adopted by the UN Security Council under Resolution 350. This established the Alpha Line, which separated between Israeli and Syrian territory, and a UN-monitored buffer zone between Alpha and Bravo lines separating both of our military forces. The demilitarized zone and the limitation zone are supervised by a UN disengagement observer force called UNDO, which is mandated to ensure that no military personnel or munitions enter that specific area. But in recent years, Iranian-led terror activity inside Syria has posed an increased threat to Israel's security and to the stability of the agreement of disengagement. Since the outbreak of the war in Syria in 2011, Iran has attempted to entrench itself and its proxies, including the Lebanese terror group Hezbollah in southern Syria, close to Israel's border. During 2018 and 2019, Iranian militants launched direct aerial attacks on Israel from inside Syria. The IDF thwarted an attack on Israel from the buffer zone in the Syrian Golan Heights. And more recently, the IDF thwarted an attempt by four terrorists to place an improvised explosive device near the Alpha Line against Israel. The terrorists crossed the buffer zone between Israel and Syria towards the Israeli security fence before they were stopped by IDF troops. These incidents constitute severe violations of the agreement on disengagement. UNDOF should ensure Syria refrains from stationing forces and munitions inside the demilitarized zone and that they remain entirely behind the Bravo line. Israel is fully within its rights to cross the fence, bearing in mind that it doesn't cross the Alpha line because the fence is several meters shy of the Alpha line. Crossing the fence does not mean entering into Syrian territory, it only means that we crossed our fence. The IDF will continue to defend Israeli sovereignty in northern Israel and will not hesitate to respond to any attack from inside Syria, whether it's from Syrian forces, Hezbollah terror operatives, or Iranian militias. We stand prepared. And uh, so that's... That, that is going on in northern Israel. That, so I think what you need to pay attention to from a Bible prophecy standpoint is Iran and Turkey. Now, Russia is still involved. Um, Putin was coughing up a storm this week. I don't know if he's well. 
They issued a report in Russia saying that if you want to see Putin, you've got to self-isolate quarantine for 14 days. No question, no, no exceptions. So he's being protected. They have a vaccine that they're rolling out. Um, you know, take any of these things at your own risk, is my opinion. But the um, also watch Turkey. I'm going to use this graphic a lot in the future. This is how Turkey sort of views the Middle East, and they've had some economic problems. So what did what is Erdogan doing? He's very clever. He's come out. Hey, we're economic reforms. We're going to do great. Everything's going to be good. We're building. I don't know if he's used the term building back better yet, but it wouldn't surprise me. But he also issued this statement. This is from his uh, English language Twitter account. We are a country way larger than 780,000 square kilometers. This guy's got big plans. So you need to watch him, but also watch uh, Iran. So we know there's activity going on. This was the front page of the Tehran Times the other day. This particular thing, back off. It was a message, would you think, to whoever's going to still be president of the United States and to Israel. Israel's they have new elections. They're supposed to get a budget in the next month. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. Um, Netanyahu's going through a tri criminal trial. I mean, everything is in... Crazy turmoil. There's war going on in Ethiopia. Too. I mean, everywhere, the second most populous African country is having a war with itself. Um, so here's all these missile ranges that they can reach. And Iran's really been releasing a lot of information about their missile capabilities. I think there's a very close connection between Iran and North Korea. And we saw North Korea, they rolled out the largest liquid-fueled rocket on the planet in their recent thing, whether it's operational or not, it is anybody's guess. But listen, these Iran is saying, look at all of our missiles and technology. And they're smart people. They're developing all of these things. And so this is an article from one of the Iranian websites, why is Iran talking about intercontinental ballistic missiles now? But I'm just going to play a video, part of a documentary that was done by Iran. Now you see here Soleimani. This thing is about 40 minutes long, and relax, we're not going to play 40 minutes of it. But it's sort of a tribute to Soleimani, and it starts out with photographs of him before he was killed in a, a U.S. attack uh, last year. And now what happened here? I think my computer just shut down. Well, that's a good point to end. There's a, I'll play it this week. I, if I have time to do an update, we have family coming in uh, to spend time with us. I don't know if I'll have time to do an update this week. Maybe I'll gather all the little great nieces and nephews. Hey, you want to come down in the basement and watch Uncle John talk about the end of the world and the coming war in the <laughs> Middle East? Come on, gather around. We have pictures and videos and everything. So I don't know if I'll do that. Um, one of them would come down, I know, him. He would, yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, so I will talk about it. Yeah, my, I don't know why my computer shut down. So, that, listen, in that video, what you didn't see at the end is they have all of these um, uh, uh, crosshairs uh, on Americans. Let me, if you give me just a second, I'll pull it up and play the end of it. And you know what? I think it's, <laughs> I think it might be the Iranians don't want me to play that video. So let me pull it up. Yeah, no, it, it, my system crashed the other day earlier, um, but it's an interesting. Here we go. Mm -hmm. 
So it shows stuff about their, has people involved in their uh, missile technology. This is the new leader. This is a guy, I think, who shot down the, the one airline. But look, here's sort of like all these different people, Netanyahu, people in Congress, hard revenge, here are our missiles, we're coming to get you. These are people that Biden will go if he's put in office and say, hey, let's make a deal. Let's, let's put that deal back in place. So these are U.S. bases and stuff, and you'll see the crosshairs here. You'll see here's Trump. There's your crosshairs, there's Netanyahu. That's Mark Esper, Vice President Pence, Secretary of State Pompeo, the White House, Melania, Ivanka and Jared. We're coming after you guys. So that's, well, that's the Iranian thing. So this is, this is a serious threat. This is something that really needs to be dealt with. So, uh, on that happy note, um, listen, don't fret, but be, you know, what's the wise as serpents and harmless as doves? Um, we have some real serious issues that are going to be, the body of Christ is going to be faced with in the coming weeks and months. Um, I, I don't think we're going to, they're talking about a great reset. There's no great go back to uh, 2019, the salad days of 2019. They seem like a long time ago, don't they? But listen, God's in control. And if we're truly in Christ, we know what happens to us. We should not, we should take comfort in that. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for the guidance that you give us in your word. Lord, I pray that you will keep us mindful that you are in control of this situation and that our responsibility is to continue to go and share the gospel of Jesus Christ and make disciples everywhere that we can. Bless us this week. In Jesus' name, amen.